I am Veronica Munk and I am the editor-in-chief at Telex, which is one of the largest Hungarian online news outlets. And my co-editor-in-chief is Szabolcs Dúl. Prior to founding Telex, I was the deputy editor-in-chief for Hungary's leading independent news site called Index. However, on the 21st July 2020, alongside the rest of the board and 80 other journalists and editors, I resigned after the firing of our editor-in-chief, Szabolcs Dúl. He was fired after publicly warning that Index's independence was at risk after a business plan was leaked, which showed drastic changes to the editorial staff. This caused Index to change its barometer on editorial freedom from independent to in danger. This was the first time the dial had been moved since the meter was created in 2018. This occurred at a time when the Hungarian media sphere was quite shocked by political influences. In the last 10 years, the Hungarian media sphere changed and there were more and more media outlets that is con basically controlled by political forces. And there is a large foundation like a trust called Keshma, uh, which includes more hundred Hungarian media outlets and centralized basically from by the government. I find this is a large problem that the media pluralism is in a great danger in this country and there are fewer and fewer independent outlets remain in Hungary. When we founded Telex, we knew that, we, that, that there can be only one mistake if we do not try it. On the day we quit, more than 80 of us, there were thousands and thousands of people marching on the streets of Budapest because, because people felt that something really important happened and, and the media pluralism and freedom of press is in danger in the country. So we knew that we somehow need to fill this void that happened after we, we left our, our, our previous uh, workplace index. When we founded Telex, we thought that there will be some kind of political attack or something uh, on us, but it's never happened. What happened is that uh, the Hungarian government basically ignores us. It's really hard to us to get on the record answers from the from the Hungarian state or Hungarian authorities. I just, I just tell you one data. Uh, in the first hundred days uh, of Telex's existence, we sent out uh, 52 requests to Hungarian ministries uh, and we only get nine answers. I am Patricia Delvin and I'm a journalist for the Sunday World newspaper based in Northern Ireland. In June 2020, I went public with threats to the safety and security of myself and my family due to my reporting. This was part of an ongoing intimidation campaign led by at least one criminal gang operating under the name of Loyalist Paramilitary Grips. For the last two years, I've been subjected to an online smear and trolling campaign for my reporting. It has been sectarian and misogynistic in nature. In October 2019, I received a message to my personal Facebook in which the sender threatened to rape my newborn son. It was signed off in the name of a neo-Nazi terrorist organization, Combat 18, which in the past has had links to loyalist paramilitaries. I've also falsely been accused of being a police informant, an allegation designed to put me at further risk in my job as a journalist. This was followed by a series of death threats passed to me by police at the end of November. The last threat said that I would be shot. 
why police are able to pass these threats on to me and tell me the paramilitary group that they emanate from, there have been no arrests. In October 2019, I reported the rape threat to my son, and although police were able to, to identify the source, no one has been arrested. Due to what I feel is an inadequate investigation by the police into that threat, I have been forced to make a complaint to the Police Ombudsman of Northern Ireland. Since journalists began reporting in Northern Ireland, they've always been subjected to threats. This goes back right before the Troubles, and during the Troubles, journalists were regularly threatened. And sadly, even after the Troubles ended, journalists continue to be threatened, and some of them have lost their lives. In the last three years, those threats have escalated alarmingly due to the fallout from Brexit, the vacuum in government. Numerous journalists are getting threatened almost now at this stage on a weekly basis by paramilitary groups, and that's both Republican and Loyalist. In May 2020, a blanket threat by a terrorist organisation calling itself South East Antrim UDA put a blanket threat on two newspapers in Northern Ireland. Uh, that was the Sunday Life and the Sunday World newspapers. All of their staff were threatened. Well, first and foremost, the police need to start investigating the people who are sending these threats. We don't only have journalists receiving threats and no action has been taken to investigate them. We also have journalists who have been murdered here and no one has been held accountable for that. Uh, a Sunday World colleague, Martin O'Hagan, this year will mark 20 years since he was gone down by loyalist paramilitaries. His killers still walk the streets to this day free. No one has been held to account and that's because some of those people are understood to be police informants, protected intelligence sources. We, can, we only have to look at the resources that was put into investigating two journalists for doing a documentary on loyalist paramilitary violence on the Lock and Island Massacre. Trevor Burney and Barry McCaffrey were wrongly arrested. Their documents, all their, their, their journalist material seized. It was a huge operation. There's absolutely none of that action being taken against the people who are threatening press freedom here on a daily basis in Northern Ireland. Well, first of all, sol solidarity, first and foremost. And for a long time, I was made to feel that I shouldn't speak out, that I should just live with it, because in Northern Ireland it was just, you know, you're a journalist, you're going to get threatened. No, that shouldn't be the way. By keeping silent about it and not speaking out about the lack of help that you're receiving from authorities, you're only, you're only making things worse for yourself. Speak out, highlight what's wrong, help make a change. I'm Jonathan Taylor. Um, I was a former lawyer with uh, SBM Offshore. Um, I'm now a whistleblower. Um, in February 2014, the Dutch magazine Quote uh, published what was a Wikipedia exposure by myself, um, witnessing $250 million worth of bribes for five years up to 2012 um, made by SBM Offshore. As a result of that expose, um, I met with uh, public prosecutors in the UK, Brazil, Netherlands and the US, and over $820 million worth of fines um, and three prosecutions have occurred as a result of my whistleblowing. Um, as recently as November 2020, Switzerland is also now investigating SBM offshore. Unsurprisingly, um, I have been targeted as a result of my actions. Um, in September 2014, SBM lodged a criminal complaint in Monaco against me. And then in June 2015, 
um, SBM initiated failed defamation uh, case um, in Rotterdam against me. Um, in July of last year, um, when going on a one week holiday with my family, um, I was um, apprehended at Dubrovnik Airport uh, under an Interpol red notice um, for the offence of bribery and corruption, um, calling for my extradition to Monaco. Um, in front of my family, um, uh, in what was, I say, the commencement of a, of a, of a short summer holiday. Um, I'm now stuck in Croatia well into my seventh month, um, approximately what is now 230 days um, in the um, tug of war of extradition proceedings. Um, currently, uh, the court, county court in Dubrovnik determined I should be extradited on the 31st of December 2020, and that decision has been appealed to the Supreme Court uh, here where I am now in Zagreb. It's essential whistleblowers are protected to ensure um, we can empower and embolden civil society to challenge corruption and strengthen democracy. It's very straightforward. It's about um, freedom of expression. It's about being able to do um, the right thing and being treated in the right way um, as a result of doing the right thing. These days it's more retribution. It's the, the days of silencing me are pretty much over. I, I think I've, I've blown the whistle as hard as I can to all the right parties. Um, uh, but yes, it's, it's all about um, potential whistleblowers not having to face that which I have faced um, so they can they can go with their their moral compass. They can do the right thing without fear of retribution. And unfortunately, we're not there yet here in Europe. I have to say, without the support um, of journalists, um, my plight would have been a very uh, lonely um, plight. And I cannot express my gratitude more. Um, to the role journalists play um, hand in hand with whistleblowers in getting the message out. Um, without journalists, I, I fear for where I'd be today. Um, they have made the difference without an iota of doubt. Do the right thing. Don't um, regret not doing the right thing for, for the rest of your life. Um, by the very nature that you're thinking about this, you're obviously of the right persona. You've got to be. You've got to be quite brave, of course. Hi, I'm Tanya Milevska. I'm a Macedonian journalist based in Brussels. I work for the state news agency Mia. In July 2020, I reported on comments uh, made by the Hungarian uh, Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, in a video recording he had made in, made in support of the main opposition party in the country. After having noted that he was not using the constitutional name of the country, which in North Macedonia is a very sensitive topic, I received threats of sexual and physical abuse on social media, including via private messages, and a message that stated, my advice to you when you come home, if the lights in your entrance hall go out, just get on your knees and pray. At the end of 2020, I responded to a long Twitter thread sharing misogynistic content regarding the computer gaming community. Since then, I have received hundreds of messages from pseudonymous accounts, which include gendered insults, threats of rape, and a reward of a thousand euros being offered to anyone who would hack my Twitter account. To this day, these violent misogynistic attacks continue on a daily basis, including attempts to hack my email and social media accounts every two or three weeks, especially since the Me Too movement started gripping North Macedonia and the Western Balkans these past few weeks. Gendered harassment and threats of sexual violence against women in journalism is too widespread and prevalent across Europe. We need to fight the normalization of this type of abuse to ensure women can continue their work. I need Twitter for my work, so I have to find a way to keep using it without, without feeling 
uh, without feeling attacked every time I open it. The, the aim of these trolls and anonymous accounts is to, to tire women at a, at a, to, to a point where they don't engage anymore in, in online debates, which is a loss for, for, for the wider public. Well, it's it, clearly there needs to be regulation of the platforms and the way they moderate the comments, uh, who decides, how do they decide uh, to, to uh, censor certain comments or not, uh, why do they allow attacks of um, anonymous trolls against women. So there's a, there's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that needs to be debated in depth by the, the social media platforms themselves, together with, with regulators. But at this point, uh, platforms like Twitter have become uh, either useless or dangerous for women. What is very important, and it's very hard to achieve, is solidarity among journalists, uh, and, and especially journalists, feminist journalists, or, or journalists who deal with gender issues, or who are vocal feminists. Uh, it's uh, extremely important to 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 also preserve your mental health. I have many colleagues in different countries. So this is not only about the Balkans or only about North Macedonia. This is something that happens all across Europe and the United States. So what we need is to preserve our mental health. If you feel that you cannot deal with the attacks online, you can withdraw and ask for help. My name is Jovan Martinovic, and I'm an investigative journalist based in Montenegro. I covered topics of organized crime and corruption um, in the Balkan region and um, wider for um, big um, international outlets like Financial Times, The Economist, um, the BBC, National Public Radio in the US. I was arrested in uh, 2015 at the end of October for uh, alleged participation in a drug trafficking ring, while in reality I was doing a story for, um, on weapon smuggling from the Balkans uh, to France. And um, as such, um, I was made um, a target of uh, certain um, circles in Montenegro. Uh, the police asked me to uh, confess my crime, which I refused, and uh, hence I spent 15 months in prison, nearly 15 months. Um, in 2019, in January 2019, I was sentenced to um, 18 months of prison uh, for uh, charges of facilitating um, marijuana trafficking and uh, membership in criminal organization. Um, the uh, whole case was returned by the second instance court and I was again in October last year, 2020, convicted um, to 12 months uh, of prison for just uh, participating in a marijuana uh, trafficking uh, ring. Uh, nevertheless, um, it's a tough thing to be a um, journalist um, in the Balkans, Southeastern Europe, especially in Montenegro, which uh, hasn't uh, had uh, full swing democratic changes uh, since the fall of the Iron Curtain. Uh, thus, um, I stand with all other journalists, um, persecuted journalists, and I know what it what it is like to be um, in an um, environment uh, which is hostile to investigative journalism and to spreading truth. Well, it means that uh, people should be careful uh, what they do and what they think. Uh, Montenegro has a legacy of um, one political party ruling from 1945 until uh, 2020, and um, inability to change government and to uh, impose real reforms is uh, something that uh, scares a lot of people. And um, hence, uh, seeking truth and uh, publishing truth is something equal to a criminal offence. What it takes is to uh, make sure that all people are equal before the law and the constitution so that whoever has done any uh, wrong is accountable. Um, and this culture of impunity is very, very strong in Montenegro and, and, and the other countries uh, in the Balkans. And that has to be changed. I mean, that people finally believe that someone will be held accountable for his or her wrongdoings. 
Um, it, it affects your life. I mean, you 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 have uh, enormous expenses, legal expenses, and you pay lawyers that you know that they cannot help you because the judiciary is in Montenegro is not independent and free. And you, you just have to put up with a lot of injustice. You, you have to be um, aware that the court will uh, snub you and reject all your pleas and um, uh, motions for access to your case files. Uh, all your evidence, uh, all the evidence in your favor will be rejected. So you are dealing with something that uh, you, you have to deal with, but you, you can't change it. I mean, that, that's the worst thing. You know that uh, you are, as a person, you are unable to make any change, even though the law and the constitution guarantees freedom and fair trial and all that stuff. My name is Corinne Vella. In 2017, my sister, the Maltese investigative journalist Daphne Caruana Galizia, was murdered in a car bomb just yards from her home. Daphne was covering politics in Malta. She found herself exposing the impact of corruption, opaque power and organized crime. The readership of her blog equals that of all of Malta's newspapers combined. She was assassinated to be kept quiet. It was also to send a threat to all others seeking transparency, justice, and democracy. In the years since Daphne's death, all members of her family have been fighting for justice. Every victory we have had has been a fight. The establishment of a public inquiry, the membership of the inquiry panel, even the extension of the inquiry itself, every inch has had to be fought for. Daphne's murder did not come out of nowhere. During her lifetime, she faced a mountain of threats. They were meant to scare her into silence. The first time she was sued was in 1994. And since then, during her professional life, 67 defamation lawsuits have been filed against her, most of them in the lead up to her death. At the time she was killed, she still faced 47 civil and criminal libel suits. And today, 22 active cases remain, and her family still have to fight them. Daphne's bank account was frozen. Her home was set on fire. There were smear campaigns against her, some even led by officials in the Prime Minister's office. Her murder is a direct outcome of impunity and the different forces in Malta and elsewhere that are trying to stifle the press and undermine the public's right to know. No family of a journalist should have to fight so hard and for so long to ensure justice is achieved. Impunity, the failure to act, all of this undermines our cause for justice. Worse, it tells other journalists in Malta to stay away if they want to be safe. Um, we can also see just how fragile everything is, you know, how easily state institutions can be taken over and used for people's you know, nefarious ends. I am optimistic. If we weren't, we wouldn't be doing this. I am optimistic, but I'm not, I don't have any illusions. It's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be soon, and it's not going to be without a fight. And we know that every inch we gain has to be fought for, and we have to fight to maintain it. You know, one thing that people have now understood is that you can't take freedom for, for granted. You have to fight for it, and you have to fight for it every day. There's one good thing that came out of all this, is that civil society has started to find its voice. That's a really good thing. And that's going to be really important to Walter's future. Don't think of this as something that matters to one family alone. Don't think of it as something that matters to one country alone. A threat to media freedom here is a threat to media freedom in Europe. A threat to a journalist here is a threat to everybody's right to know across Europe. What we know from Daphne's work is that what she uncovered does not concern Malta alone. It concerns the whole of Europe and beyond. Because it fills in the gaps where state institutions fail. Organised crime is meant to be contained by state institutions, and when it isn't, journalism reveals it, and then the state institutions have to take over. 
If they don't, journalists are left alone and we will lose our right to know along with the journalists themselves. I am Thomas Laschig, the founder and editor-in-chief of Volksverpetzer, an online platform looking at dis- and misinformation based in Augsburg, Germany. My colleagues and I look at fake news and manipulation on the net, and since the start of 2020, we have scrutinized disinformation networks related to the COVID-19 pandemic. At the end of 2020, we received a legal threat from Wolfgang Wodak who is demanding damages of 250,000 euro, while also threatening us with a cease and desist letter. The legal action relates to two articles we published, which fact-checked and countered comments made by Wolfgang Wodak. Statements he had made prior to our articles have been refuted by sources, including Tagesschau, Tagesspiegel, Welt and MDR. A number of politicians, doctors and epidemiologists had condemned Wodak's statements as false and refutable. Yet Wolfgang Wodak's lawyer, Rainer Füllmich, claims Volksverpetzer is fully responsible for the damages to Wodak's reputation. Volksverpetzer is only a small outlet with only two permanent members of staff funded through contributions from our readers. This legal threat is an existential threat to our outlet and a strong incentive for us to avoid these topics. This is the impact of legal threats made against outlets across Europe, and we may never know the full extent of the stories that should have been told, but cannot because of legal threats like the one facing Volksverpetzer. The biggest challenge for us is, of course, uh, the uh, financial aspect, because we are only um, able to pay for everything through contributions um, from our readers. We don't have that much money to uh, engage in endless legal battles. And of course, there's always this uh, threat and I guess uh, what they could be aiming to do uh, that we are being financially ruined by this but as well as that uh, we are being targeted by an online mob uh, because these legal threats uh, make us out as uh, enemies and put a target on our back um, which uh, makes us the victims of um, hate speech and threatening emails as well We're pretty sure we were uh, targeted and not uh, larger media outlets precisely because we are not a large media outlet and because we don't have the money, we don't have the backing, we don't have the uh, seasoned lawyers uh, that can defend against, against such uh, threats. And we think um, they are trying to um, use us as an um, example of destroying the opposing media, the Lügenpresse, um, the mainstream media, um, because in their eyes, we're saying the same things, um, but at the same time, we're not uh, 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 the, as perceived threat to them because of our um, small reach and uh, because we are a small outlet. For reporters, for media outlets, for journalists that are trying to do honest reporting, that uh, try to unveil uh, corruption and disinformation and such, um, they are being threatened by such lawsuits. And um, often enough, I see cases like this, like... Um, Yeah, bullies uh, with a media platform that have the money and the influence uh, to launch such legal action and that they can um, silence opposition um, and uh, reporting all their deeds. I'm Chadash Kaplan, a Kurdish journalist and the former editor-in-chief of uh, Yeni Yaşam. Uh, on the 9th of August 2020, journalist Percem Mordenis and I noticed a group of police officers handcuffing a young man uh, at the entrance of uh, Ermus Street in Athens, Greece. After we spoke to the police, uh, they started to insult us. 
as the person being arrested was uh, calling out for help uh, and uh, we presented our press IDs and started to record uh, the arrest using our phones. The police uh, first tried to stop me recording uh, and after he grabbed my phone and threw it uh, in, on the floor. As a result, I was uh, assaulted and uh, handcuffed. After Bercham tried to retrieve my phone, uh, she was also arrested. Then we were uh, taken to the Acropolis police station. In the police vehicle, after I, our IDs uh, were confiscated, we were also subjected uh, to physical assault and racist oibus uh, labeled uh, as foreigners. We were detained for around eight hours. Evidence of our physical mistreatment was documented in a medical report uh, we obtained following our release. I was accused of violating a number of articles of the Greek criminal code, including violence against public servants and legal clerks and actual bodily harm. The legal threats are uh, still ongoing. Um, I'm accused of illegally video typing uh, to police, and if I found uh, guilty, my request for political asylum may be affected. I and Kurdish colleagues have faced the police violence in Turkey. Of course, the situation negatively affects a journalist. Now, I think twice when I'm taking an image in area where they are police. And I prepare myself for all negatively uh, that can be experienced. But no matter what, we will continue to be journalists. Journalism is not a crime.